Well, thank you very much. Uh, so the, the title today is So You Want to Be a Surgeon. Um, but another title I think is germane to the topic is Choosing Surgery, Dispelling Myths, and Picking Mentors. Uh, like we said, I'm a, a thoracic surgeon, Division of Cardiothoracic Surgery at UC Davis Medical Center. The medical center is in Sacramento. Uh, the, the undergraduate campus is at Davis. Um, so the hospital and the medical school is all in, in, uh, in Sacramento. Just to kind of get, get an understanding of, where, of who's here today, uh, raise your hand if you're uh, in college. Raise your hand if you're in medical school. Raise your hand if you're in uh, 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 high school or earlier. Well, good, good. Well, welcome. Raise your hand if you're, if you're in college in California. Raise your hand outside of California. So we're Canada. Canada. Excellent. What, what part of Canada? Vancouver. Vancouver. I was in uh, Vancouver not too long ago. It was a beautiful, beautiful city. So uh, what is a surgeon? We're going to talk about a few things today. We're going to talk about what is a surgeon, define a surgeon, and really how to become one. I'm going to discuss what I call the five myths, okay? At each point in your training, someone is going to try to tell you something that's not true to really kind of to discourage you from attaining your goals and accomplishing what you want to accomplish. These are sort of the five great myths that you need to identify and to avoid. Then we're going to talk about picking mentors. Uh, a mentor is someone who guides you through the process to achieve your goals. You know, we could think that we could power through all this on our own, but really we can't. We really need to ident identify someone who's going to help us, uh, keep us from spinning our wheels, to, uh, uh, to give us sage advice, and to really ease the process. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon, so I'm going to give a little bit of plug about what I do, uh, what I do in the OR, uh, how do you become a cardiothoracic surgeon, and uh, really what's the process in addition to surgery to, to do uh, cardiothoracic surgery. So what is a surgeon? A surgeon is a medical specialist who practices surgery. Um, it comes from the Greek from chirurgos. Again, I apologize to anyone here from Greek, Greek descent for my pronunciation, but doing by hand, from sheer hand ergon work, so working with your hands to perform an operation. An operation is a procedure performed in a living body, usually with instruments, especially for the repair of damage or the restoration of health. So really, we're using surgery to cure disease. We're using surgery to restore function. Does anyone here have a grandparent or a relative who's had a hip replacement or a knee replacement? So you can see that relative went from a, a, a process of pain to a process of absence of pain or improved function. This is an example of, uh, of a surgery, a, a, a time in, a, in the operating room, really using meticulous uh, 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 use of hands. Uh, we don't always use Google in the, in, the, uh, in the operating room, as this cartoon implies. So how do you become a surgeon? Well, first you have to go to college. Then you have to go to medical school. Then you have to go to a residency. And then you're a surgeon, so it's pretty easy, right? It takes a couple of years, and, and there you go. It's a, it's a long process, really. And at each stage, you need to dispel myths, which I'll talk about, and you need to find a mentor to help you uh, uh, to accomplish that stage and move on to the next one successfully. So the five, five myths. Myth number one, there are no surgeons like me, okay? So these are, are two of the most gifted surgeons in the history of our country. This is Dr. Benjamin Carson. He's a, uh, a pediatric neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins. And um, obviously, I, identif I identify with Dr. Carson uh, uh, very much. This is Vivian Thomas. Does anyone here know who Vivian Thomas is? Vivian Thomas. Um, there was a movie made about him, an HBO movie starring Mos Def. Is, is Mos Def still popular? Is anyone, well, uh, you know, he was a popular, I guess, rapper and et cetera. Um, uh, he's not doing that. I guess someone told me he changed his name. I, it might be Less Def, I don't know. <laughs> but um, Vivian Thomas um, was a person, really part of Johns Hopkins and Vanderbilt University's history. He's one of the greatest cardiothoracic surgeons uh, of our time, but he wasn't an MD. Because of the, 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 the culture of that time, he, wasn't, he was sort of denied the opportunity to be an MD. 
but yet again someone who I obviously very Id identify with uh, one of our top surgeons so really there's 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 no real as, as excuse for saying there's there's no surgeons like me and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit later the second myth is I'm not smart enough to be a surgeon if this baby is able to trade stocks online then we're smart enough to be a surgeon third is well I'm I'm not even smart to go to medical school let alone be a surgeon again with the baby Four, I can't afford college or medical school medical school really should not be reserved for a certain type of, of, of person of, 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 of born with gift uh, you have a right to go to medical school now you're not going to see that in any law or any manifesto but you have yourself have to believe that you have a right to go to medical school or do something so you could accomplish that now uh, medical school is expensive and, and college uh, uh, is expensive but really you have to and some medical schools have great financial aid packages and some medical schools have awful financial aid packages but the reality is is that you'll learn this as you grow older there's good debt and then there's bad debt bad debt is like credit card debt credit card debt's awful you do not want to be in credit card uh, debt but educational debt is in, in many respects good debt because a it provides you with an education allows you to go to the college or the medical school that you feel is optimal for you the reality in medicine is that in certain specialties in medicine your income is going to be such where your monthly payments for a medical loan is not going to hurt you in a financial sort of way the reality is also such that if you decide to go in a branch of medicine that's underserved and especially serves underserved communities there's a lot of loan forgiveness programs that helps you ameliorate those th those loans and allow you to to serve some of those underserved communities so don't let the the, the cost of education deprive you of an education if there's not scholarship or free money then educational debt is something that maybe you should take on so you can accomplish your goals and the final myth is med schools and residency are not reflective of me and we'll discuss that a little bit more so picking mentors what is a mentor and how do you find them so again I'm going to go to linguistics route here so mentor derives from Latin from the Greek mentor a trusted counselor or guide so this is actually mentor the person right there your mentor may find you otherwise you need to find him or her so sometimes a mentor just basically falls into your lap they take an interest in you they see you in a crowd pick you out guide you through the process and you become successful having this mentor as your guide and that happens but the reality is, is that's not that's not the rule it's very uncommon you might have to seek out a mentor and find a person in that specialty or in that field that you want to learn more about or become more educated about and strike a relationship with that person to help guide you through that process and a mentor never embraces one of the five myths so if someone teaches teaches you one of those five myths then obviously that person does not have your best interest in mind and you need to move forward and find another mentor to help accomplish your goals so a mentor really sort of guides you through the process and through this sort of wild woods and, and forest here these are my original mentors my parents and my brother and sister they're the ones who really sort of set the foundation for me to to be grow up to be who I am so go to college I first uh, I uh, matriculated to UC Berkeley for college any Berkeley uh, students here hey go Bears I'm sorry if you saw that Oregon game the other day it's just, yeah tell me about it so uh, in college you know I was first faced with the first myth I'm not smart enough to be a surgeon I'm not smart enough to go to medical school so I went to pre-med counseling and the individual was doing the pre-med counseling said I was not going to get into medical school okay obviously that person was wrong right but it wasn't a situation where okay I went on with things to see how things occurred and things started to work out and then ten years later I'm sitting around and said oh you know that person was wrong when that person said that to me nanosecond in one ear out the other okay because I knew that's what I wanted to do and I had to figure it out to accomplish that goal so 
that person did not discourage me from doing what I wanted to do because inside I knew that I wanted to go to medical school. I needed to figure it out. Okay. And by saying that, that's implying that I'm not smart enough to go to medical school. But all, if, all, if you're in this room today or you're listening to this broadcast, that shows you you have, the ins you have insight and you are smart enough to go to medical school. This was really my first mentor in, in college, my biggest mentor in college. This is Marion Koshland. Um, she was an immunologist uh, uh, professor at UC Berkeley. Un unfortunately, she's passed away. But she, I w did research in her laboratory, and she was very influential for developing my academic career. She really opened up my mind into what I was capable of doing, what, I, I what, what, what qual positive quality attributes that I had. She really guided me in terms of picking the med schools that I applied to and how I built my CV and my resume. Now, Marion and I are from totally different walks of life. We never would have met each other um, walking down the Sprawl Plaza or, or uh, AC Transit. It just wouldn't have happened. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to do research. I was a molecular and cell biology major, uh, immunology. So I went on the, the, the MCB website. I went to all, looked at all the research projects for all the immunologists uh, that were there. I looked to see what research projects I thought were interesting that I would like to learn more about. I called their office. I asked if I could meet with the different professors. I showed up. I had a tie. I dressed nicely. I had them a copy of my little puny resume uh, uh, in my hand. And I showed up and I, and I, and I, since this is my major, I knew what I was talking about. And I sat down and I talked with these four professors to talk about the research and what I could do to contribute. And I liked Marion's work, and I joined her laboratory. I did a thesis in her laboratory, and it really opened up multiple doors to what I was capable of. Marion didn't find me. I found Marion, and that's what you have to do. You have to be proactive. Uh, two other individuals, as I was looking at medical school, this is Keith Amos. He's a surgical oncologist now at, at University of North Carolina. But at the time, he was at Harvard Medical School, and he really pushed me to try to go to Harvard Medical School and said, we 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 like you, I think you would do well here. Uh, this is Michael Smith, um, he's a, a th cardiothoracic surgeon in Phoenix now. At the time he was at UCSF and he also uh, said, come to UCSF, we really would like you here. And these two individuals showed to me that there are people in medical school like me. Michael, I'm from Oakland, anyone here from Oakland? Well that's okay, I won't hold it against you. But Michael was also from Oakland, his dad played for the Raiders and with similar background and he was a a student at UCSF. So in college, we dispelled those two myths. I'm not smart enough to be a surgeon. I'm not smart enough to go to medical school. So then you graduate from college, you get into medical school, and then you go to medical school. In medical school, this is Megan Sykes, again, a, a transplant immunologist. I found her, worked in her lab, really opened up a lot of doors and defined to me what academic medicine was all about. She was my mentor. This is my, my med school class. This is at Harvard Medical School. This is the um, 1994, the, the class of 1998. Uh, can anyone pick me out in this crowd? We had a guy in the last session, he was like a savant in this. Can, can you pick me out? Any wild guesses? Whoops. Well, there I am, right there. That was about 75 pounds ago. So, <laughs> what do you notice about this class? Not very diverse. I, I would disagree. It's a, one, it's a large class, okay. What about the number of women in this class? Quite a few. This is the first class in, in Harvard Medical School that was over 50% female, okay. This class has a lot of minorities in it. Very diverse class. There are people from all different backgrounds from all different countries, okay? Raise your hand if, you're, if English is your second language. Raise your hand if English is your third language. Raise your hand if you immigrated to this country. Raise your hand if your parents immigrated to this country. Raise your hand if your, if your parents have been in this country since the 1800s. So, ra so my point is, I don't care who you are, what your background is, what your religion is, 
what your sexual orientation is, what your ethnicity is, there is someone like you in medicine, okay? So when you say, well, there's no one like me, that's not true. There, one of my best friends from this class, in our, um, our first year in the class, she was 18 years old. There was another member in this class who was 38 years old. There's people from Ghana, people from all, all different walks of life. There's an ancient Greek history major in the class. So uh, there's an Olympic athlete in the class. So no matter who you are, what your background is, there's someone like you. So that, we go on to the next myth, there are no surgeons like me. So I went on to Massachusetts General Hospital for residency. Uh, got this picture because lots of snow, thought it was pretty cool. Um, these were the individuals in, in, in my residency who really kind of guided me and mentored me. Um, Simona Shiku is now a thoracic surgeon in private practice in Walnut Creek. Uh, Dr. Ferguson was our residency director. Uh, Dr. Batiste and Dr. Grillo, thoracic surgeons, who really uh, influenced me in choosing my career. And, and Dr. Watkins was a vascular surgeon and great role model. This is my first year in uh, residency in Mass General Hospital. Can you pick me out in this crowd? Right there, that was about 40 pounds ago. And this is my, my last year at Massachusetts General Hospital. Can you pick me out? Right in the front row. And again, um, a lot of women in this, cl in this class, um, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos. So this, there is diversity here and people like you in surgery. I went on to do a cardiothoracic residency at University of Michigan. And again, um, uh, mentors from all different walks of life all different backgrounds who all have helped uh, guide my career. Dr. Alan Pickens, a thoracic surgeon now at Emory. Dr. Oringer, one of the fathers of, of modern thoracic surgery. Uh, Dr. Barghisi, uh, who's a year ahead of me in fellowship, uh, who's a thoracic surgeon at the University of Washington, and others who really helped uh, guide me to what I am today. So those are the myths. So you need to avoid these myths. Uh, and you need to find a mentor. A mentor may find you, otherwise you need to find him or her. And a mentor never teaches one of the five myths uh, that we show here. If they do, then you need to move on because they're not an adequate mentor. Next, I'm going to discuss a little bit about what is cardiothoracic surgery. So cardiothoracic surgery, there are three branches, general thoracic surgery, adult cardiac surgery, and congenital cardiothoracic surgery are operating on kids, on the hearts and lungs of kids. I'm a general thoracic surgeon, so that includes lung cancer surgery, esophagectomy for cancer or removing the organ from the back of your throat down your stomach and reconstructing you so you can eat again. Lung transplants, I did that in fellowship, people with, with uh, end-stage lung failure. Benign esophageal disease, diseases of the lining of the lungs. And um, really, we're almost like a surgical oncologist. 80% of what I do is with cancers. The keystone of all this is patient, patient care. The reason why we are doing this is to cure people of disease, improve quality of life so they can spend time with their families and, and, and loved ones with a good uh, activities of daily living. That's the cornerstone of what we do as physicians. Remember, going to medical school is just not going to medical school. You know, it's, it's not Gray's Anatomy or, or ER. You're probably too young to remember ER because you're watching syndication or, or house, right? Being a physician is not, a is not an occupation. It is a calling. So when you're at the movie theater, no one ever says, is there a lawyer in the house? Or is there a CPA in the house? But once you become a medical, you don't even have to be a doctor. Once you go into medical school and someone says, is there a doctor here? You are obligated to do something, to figure it out. Doesn't matter if you are a pathologist or a pediatrician or a cardiologist or a thoracic surgeon, you've got to figure it out and help somebody. And that's happened to me on planes. It's happened to me in theaters. Um, and, it, and it happens. Teaching, uh, teaching the next generation, such as yourselves, medical students, uh, residents, and fellows. What I do is, for, it's, for instance, I would, uh, for instance, I would uh, take out part of a lung um, for a, a surgery uh, for a cancer, okay? Um, and that's called a, a, a lobectomy. Now we do things minimally invasively, okay? Uh, using cameras and small incisions to do lung surgery. That's called video-assisted thoracic surgery. This is a, using small incisions 
some of them about uh, a centimeter in size. So this is a, a lung surgery case using high-definition monitors, cameras, and small incisions. Interesting. So what we'll do is we'll just uh, uh, go to the actual film. So this is uh, in between the ribs using lidocaine to numb up the patient and then going in between the ribs with cautery. This is taking lymph nodes out of the patient. Again, cameras, small incisions. This is going around the vein, draining blood from the upper part of the lung. This is using a stapler that both staples the vein and cuts it at the same time so there's no bleeding. So I don't have to sew open, sew close the vein. This is getting around the artery, extending up to the upper part of the lung using special graspers and scissors, and then using that same stapling device to seal that artery and cut it at the same time. And this is the windpipe extending up to the upper part of the lung, using a stapler to divide that windpipe. Now I, get, I have to get the upper part of the lung off of the lower part of the lung, so I use a stapler to, to go through that fissure. And now I got to put the lung with the tumor into it in a special Kevlar bag this Kevlar so it doesn't rip when I'm bringing it out of that small hole. And then, whoop, right out of that small hole. So that's a upper lobectomy. That's kind of, that's basically what I, some of the big part of what I do, the type of surgery uh, uh, that I do. And now we have robotic surgery. So this is a, a, a robotic surgical case at UC Davis. This is Dr. Douglas Boyd who's at the robotic monitor controlling it. He's not even scrubbed. It has three-dimensional reco video reconstruction so you can see, kind of like Avatar. Here's a robot here. This is one of our physician assistants uh, deal, uh, working with the robot, making sure the arms are okay. This is a monitor so everyone in, in the room can see what's going on. So Dr. Boyd is doing the surgery sitting at the side of the room away uh, from the patient. So I assume that video is not gonna work. So. This is an example in an animal lab of a robotic coronary artery surgery. So sewing an artery onto the heart. This is real time. These are Dr. Boyd's hands working the needle and thread with the robotic hands. This is a, an artery on the pig heart. This is a, another artery that he is sewing together using very fine needle, very fine thread. This is sort of the future of, of cardiothoracic surgery. This is what you all would have to look forward to uh, uh, when you, if, if you were to join this profession. But robotic surgery is very active in other types of, of surgery. General surgery, uh, gynecology, um, um, and um, uh, other types of surgery uh, as well. So why go into cardiothoracic surgery? Uh, one is great mentors in a specialty, as I, I told you about. We're shortening, we're, we're shortening the training to make it less long. Uh, academic and clinical interests, heart disease and cancer are the number one and number two killers in the Western world. Lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer in the Western world and likely soon the entire world. Greater than 50% of the current workforce is, is age 55 years or older, which means that a lot of of cardiothoracic surgeons are going to retire or die, basically. Um, now, I'm not 55. I may seem like I'm 55, but um, we do have a, an older workforce. And the career as a cardiothoracic surgeon is rewarding. Income, one of the highest paid specialties, uh, good quality of life, options for academic or research versus private practice, um, and a sense of accomplishment, and we talked about that. There's going to be a shortage of cardiothoracic surgeons, likely by 2020. So when, he, when you all are, are, are finished with your training, there's not going to be a lot of cardiothoracic surgeons if we look at the rate. How do I become a cardiothoracic surgeon? So the current pathway, four years of medical school, followed by five years of general surgery residency, plus or minus research time, and then two to three years of, of additional cardiothoracic residency after that. So you look at that, that could be anywhere between nine to 11 years. So what we're doing now, we're having medical education reform in cardiothoracic surgery. 
where we're truncating the amount of training and we're doing what's called an integrated six-year residency where you do four years of medical school and then you match directly into cardiothoracic residency after that, so for six years. And that really cuts short your amount of time. Uh, as you go through the process, you're going to hear different terms. A residency is any board certified training program, such as general surgery, internal medicine, cardiothoracic uh, surgery, pathology, obstetrics, gynecology, which is controlled by the, um, uh, the um, accreditation council or graduate medical education, uh, very rigidly controlled uh, to make sure that it's standardized. A fellowship is not a board certification specialty, but it's just an extra year of specialized training that may have a certificate to it, but not uh, governed by the ACGME. Um, really, you'll start making decisions on what type of medicine you want to go into in your third year of medical school. And then you'll do your clinical rotations. If you're interested in surgery, you may want to have your surgical exposure earlier rather than later. In the January or February of your third year, you start planning your fourth year clinical rotations. And you, if you want to do cardiothoracic surgery, you should do a cardiothoracic surgery uh, elective and any research if time permits. So there's two paths to cardiothoracic surgery. There's the standard path, which is general surgery programs, graduate from a general surgery residency, then move on to a cardiothoracic residency. And the growing uh, second pathway is a, what's called a six-year integrated program where you go directly out of medical school into cardiothoracic surgery. And UC Davis will probably have this up and running in 2013. Um, I think the, the question I always get, should I do research? Um, and the answer is yes. You should perform research in undergraduate years or medical school years. It does not have to be basic science research. You do not have to be at a petri dish pipetting. Really, it should be anything that shows you have an understanding of the scientific process. So, and it needs to be hypothesis driven work. So it could be clinical research. It could be behavior research. You could do research on the use of iPads um, in, in um, uh, adequate iPads in, 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 in adequate insulin dosing in patients with diabetes. It could look at the, the return rate in a homeless, uh, a free homeless clinic. Um, it could be looking at uh, psychiatric research or, or any behavioral research. Um, it could be looking at the, the role of C. elegans. So any type of hypothesis driven work is what we look for. And then publications and abstracts. Publication is like a manuscript something that's published in a journal. An abstract is something that's presented at a meeting um, or a poster. It could be a national meeting, it could be your local meeting at your college or university. First authors, are eff author efforts are ideal. You need to write the majority of the manuscript and clearly understand the scope of the study. But it's perfectly fine to be the second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth author. As long as you contributed to that work, that's fine for your resume. And remember, you may need to ask to be an author. Because sometimes, you know, you may volunteer to do research in a laboratory and you do great work and that researcher does remember, to that, so that professor does remember to put you on as an author. And that's not because that person is mean or evil or anything like that. It's just that, you know, they're in work mode and there's a lot of uh, PhD candidates and postdocs who are working and they may not think to put you on as an author. So you may want to ask, hey, I really like doing research in your lab this summer. I accomplished a lot. I learned a lot. If something, if something um, is produced from this work, such as an abstract or a publication, do you mind listing me as an author? There's nothing wrong with saying that, and that's how you do amazing work. You want to be acknowledged for that. How can I become involved with research? Decide what field you're interested in. It might not be the field that you ultimately work to be in. I did a lot of transplant research. I don't do any transplant, transplants now. Pursue a mentor in that field and don't be intimidated, okay? You can sit across from a professor and discuss research topics. Don't feel that I'm not good enough to sit in that chair. You are good enough to sit in that chair. So stay focused. Um, I do have a, a Twitter account. It's at ECD underscore chest health. So if you want to send me a tweet, uh, feel right ahead. And thank you very much. I'm, I'm more than happy to ask any of your questions or answer any of your questions. I won't ask them for you. Um, when did you decide that you were interested in being a surgeon? 
Um, I think I was about five or six years old. Um, uh, there was a, a TV show uh, on TV at that time called The Six Million Dollar Man, and, uh, or basically it was The Bionic Man, really. I don't know if any of you have, have seen that or, or on uh, Nickelodeon at night or anything like that. But basically it was just this astronaut who had these uh, special robotic powers. And I just remember the montage of the beginning of the show each week where, you know, he's in an astronaut, he's in a space shuttle, someone sabotaged it, he crashed. And the next scene, they show him in the operating room, okay? And these surgeons uh, at the operating table working fiercely to put him back together. And then they state, um, we can rebuild him. We can make him stronger, faster than before. And I, that sort of resonated with me. And then I was always interested in science and biology and I and I think I I meshed the two and 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 here I am today. Any other questions? Do you know how long it is to be an orthopedic surgeon? Mm -hmm. It's 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 a little bit shorter than uh, being a cardiothoracic surgeon. So you match, just like we're reforming cardiothoracic surgery. Orthopedic surgeons did that a while ago. So you match into orthopedic surgery uh, out of medical school, and it's generally a, around a six-year residency. Okay. You, a lot of them do do extra year or two of training um, for fellowships, okay, and in things like um, sports medicine or, or joints or spine. Okay. Yep. I have a question over here. Yep. Can you tell us about the airplane uh, movie theater experiences that you've had? Sure. So um, um, I was on a flight uh, um, um, back east. Um, I was with my wife. And I was basically asleep, okay? And so then um, uh, I heard, when you, when you become a physician, uh, there are certain things that wake you up. I could sleep through anything, really. I'm a youngest child, right? I, I, could, I could sleep through anything. TV blaring, yelling, anything like that, I could, I could sleep through. The, the, the thing that wakes me up is my pager. If my pager, go, my, my wife knows it, not to call me if it's late at night, to page me, because you know I'll, I'll, I'll wake up. Um, and um, uh, two is um, uh, when someone needs help, like that, is there a doctor here? That, that phrase just uh, resonates in my brain. I, and I, so I woke up immediately and you know, someone had um, uh, passed out on the plane and really you just measure the blood pressure and um, make sure that they're doing okay and, and work them through the process. So that's uh, one example. And then the funny thing is I stood up, I looked around to get my, my orientation right, and I, s I saw a woman sitting behind me and said, aren't you in the WNBA? She's like, yes. Cool. All right, where's this, where's, what's going on? Dr. Yeah. Cook, I have a question uh, for you. W can you describe your typical day? Mm -hmm. When do you start your day? Yes. How much time do you spend in the OR yes. um, versus how much time do you spend in your office? Yes. Um, how d are you teaching as well? Yes. How does all of that work together? Okay, so um, on Monday, so let's say, let's do a typical day. On Monday, um, um, I have start cases at 7.30 a.m. Um, so what I do is I'll, I'll arrive at work around 6.30, and I'll do quick rounds on my patients to make sure everything's going fine. I have uh, residents and fellows, so many of that work has been done um, uh, by them, and I meet with them and see the patients and oversee that. At 7.30, um, I, have op I uh, meet the patient's family, uh, meet the patient before they go to sleep, um, and um, um, we move on to the operation. After the successful operation, I'll go and talk with the family in the waiting room, and that might be the whole day. Um, um, at 5 p.m., I have office hours at, at the medical school, and um, I have a charge of medical students that I supervise longitudinally through their four-year process, and they meet with me periodically during those office hours. Tuesday is very similar. Uh, Wednesday, um, I have clinic from 9 to 5, so I see patients all through that clinic. Um, from 12.30 to 1.30, we have what's called the multidisciplinary tumor board, <coughs> where I meet with the medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and surgical colleagues to discuss difficult cases. Thursday, I may have operating room. Um, I may have meetings, uh, but I also have my academic time where I, I, I dedicate to do my, my research. Um, and then Friday are various different things. I'll, I'll interview medical students for medical school admissions on Fridays. 
um, I'll we meet with students or uh, other individuals who are meeting with me about research projects uh, and et cetera. And then uh, every other weekend, I round Saturdays and Sundays with the team to see patients. Um, what is the difference in the surgeon's education for surgeries that deal with just normal people as opposed to like sports athletes, like professional athletes? Well, we're, we're, we're all sort of the same underneath the scalpel. So what you have to do, you, you learn to, you, you take the education and curriculum to be the best sports medicine surgeon that you can be. And so those people that you see in the, in the news who are, are doing the Tommy John surgery and the shoulder surgery, not only are they operating on world famous athletes, but they're also operating on your grandmother and your, your, your grandfather as well. Um, so it's the same level of expertise for, for everyone involved. Yeah, I think when you are doing high stakes surgery, um, you know, 99.9% uh, .9 of the time everything's a success, but sometimes it's not a success, or you find out that the disease process is such that you can't move forward um, with the surgery, that it's safe to maybe stop as opposed to move forward. Um, in those situations, you have to be, you have to, you have to understand that we are all in this together, right? You can't be the big professor or the big surgeon. It's not like on TV. It's not like House or, or uh, other things. You, ha you have to understand where you have to be empathetic and sympathetic, and you have to grieve with the family. Yep. Dr. Cook, a question has come in from our uh, viewing audience, yep. and uh, the student wants to know, what, what have you learned in your um, experience as a surgeon that would have been helpful for you to know before going into uh, surgical training? Yes, what, what, did I, what do I know now that I wish I knew, uh, wish I knew earlier? Um, the um, big thing is when I was an uh, intern, um, and it's kind of fun, I've thought about this quite a lot, and, and it, it, all, it, it it has all worked out fine. But then I was like, well, how could I have made it easier? When I was an intern, it was so difficult and so um, time consuming. And because of, the, because of that, there's been work hour reform, right? They've limited the amount of hours that, that all residents have to work. But prior to that, it was before work hour reform that uh, I just wanted to really load the trucks and work and I didn't do some of the scholarly academic things that, um, that I should have been doing as an intern. Um, and then when I did my research years in between, I took two years off to do pure research and residency. Then I really revved up my academics. Um, I, I really, sh and, and it wasn't because people weren't interested in working with me. I had plenty of, of professors say, hey David, why don't you work on this? Why don't you work on that? And I was just always too tired. Um, so people were actually reaching out to me. So what I do now is I reach out to interns and second year residents and say, this is a project that I think would be pretty straight for you to work on. I need someone to work on it. Are you interested? So I think knowing then I, that that first and second year, sometimes you have to stop and sort of take a deep breath and not just have blinders on and work. And yeah, yep. When should you start researching? Pardon? When should you, when should you start researching? Um, you should start as, as w when, when you can start. When you feel, you know what, I've got things under control. I think I could branch out and look for someone to work with. So when you feel that, that, that it's not going to detriment your actual scholarly work, you know, your grades, then and you got that under control then at, at, at any point. Someone had a hand, yep. Is UC Davis a level one trauma center with full transplant capabilities? UC Davis, is a, what is a level one trauma center? So a level one trauma center is basically any type of trauma that rolls in you can take care of and you have cardiothoracic surgery to help with penetrating injuries of the heart and put someone on a heart lung machine. So that's the definition of a level one trauma center. So UC Davis is basically the biggest trauma center in Northern California. Um, full transplant capabilities, so a little bit separate from, from trauma. Uh, so UC Davis does do kidney, uh, pancreas transplants. At the, this time, we don't do heart, lung, or liver transplants. Uh, oh, 
you and then you. Um, as a surgeon, I know it's been known um, to have um, tight schedule. How do you manage um, to have time with um, your family or your wife? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So, um, you know, like I said, uh, uh, surgery is an occupation, is a, is a way of life, or medicine is a way of life. So you actually bring your work home with you. Um, so you have to define what is important to you, okay? So for me, my family is very important to me. My wife and my daughter are extremely important to me. So, which means I put a protective shield over that and then that has to be that, okay? So I don't do a lot of, s this is very unusual for me to do something uh, medicine related on a weekend, okay? Um, this is one of the few exceptions that and actually traveling to a meeting, okay? Otherwise, if I don't, if I'm not traveling to a meeting and if I'm not doing this particular conference in particular, then I usually, I'm not doing medical related stuff on a weekend unless I'm on call, okay? Um, the other thing is, I'm a basic scientist in, um, in background, really, okay? That's my research background. And, but I also, I feel myself to be a good clinician and a good technical surgeon and I like medical education. I like doing things like this and, and teaching students. So um, I realized early that I couldn't do those, f those, uh, um, uh, those, I couldn't be a good basic scientist, a good technical surgeon, um, uh, a good uh, educator, and a good family person, all four. I couldn't do it. So I had to modify that. I can't, modif I, I, I can't modify my family. I like medical education, and what's the point of being a surgeon if you can't operate? So I modified my research to do something less consuming as basic science and to do more outcomes research, database analysis, and medical education research. And that way, I have time with my family. So that thing about being a surgeon and you have no time with your family, that's all a myth, right? You do what's important to you, right? And if family's important to you, then you will have time for your family no matter what you do. The President of the United States, right? People criticize the President of the United States because he went on vacation, right? But he's got a family, he's got two daughters, and he's got a wife. There's no person in the United States that's busier than him, but he was able to carve out time with his family because it's important to him. What would you say was your greatest challenge getting to where you are now? Our greatest challenge was accomplishing fear, okay? So w how do you define fear, you know? So it's not just like being scared in a movie. I can't watch Scream or anything in those movies. But it's really sort of, it's like fear of the unknown, uh, fear of the next level, fear of failure, okay? Uh, you have to accomplish that. So going on websites, looking at uh, professors and researchers and calling up their office, there's a certain level of fear factor that, that you have to accomplish and, and deal with. Applying to medical school, there's a certain level of fear factor. Going out to, the, to, the, to a city you've never been to uh, and saying, going to that medical school there and saying, you have an interview in one hour across from town in this hospital, here's the subway map, uh, don't be late. Accomplishing that fear. Um, as a second year surgical resident, there was a situation where if I didn't accomplish what I needed to do at that point, because there's no other physicians who had that skill set around, that patient would not make it. A co a controlling that fear and working expeditiously to, to do well. So that's what, that, that, that's what the biggest uh, uh, obstacle was.